マザーボー !In the spring of 2001, a 54-year-old Israeli man renewed his wedding vows. The photos would appear on the front cover of Hello! magazine. The best man was Michael Jackson, and the groom was Uri Geller, the world's most famous psychic. Ladies and gentlemen, Uri Geller. It's 30 years since Uri Geller captured the attention of the media by bending a fork on British television. Look, it's like it's becoming like plastic. Look, it's, it, it's very... <laughs> What was remarkable was that he claimed to do it using only the power of his mind. Is it magic? Tell me. It's not magic, and I'm not a magician. This is the story of a charismatic showman desperate for lasting fame. Some way, one way, almost any way, Uri Geller was going to be a star. As an entertainer, as a singer, as an astronaut, as a spy, or just possibly as a spoon bender. <laughs> It's a tale of scientists and politicians, spies and aliens. You could see people wanting to make him into a guru, and he absolutely refused. I mean, he would run away from that in a blink. I don't want to be a messenger. I don't want to be a Jesus or a Moses because I'm not. This is the bizarre saga of Geller's ongoing battle to convince the world that he truly does possess superhuman powers. Oh. At his mansion in the heart of the English countryside, Uri Geller cycles 27 miles a day. He lives in luxury, surrounded by dozens of energy-giving crystals with his two children, his wife, his wife's brother, and his mother. On his bike, Geller answers the scores of emails he receives from his army of fans around the world. I would say 70% of all emails are people asking for something, guidance. And I'm very careful what I say. Here is a very problematic one. Hi, Uri. I have a huge problem. I'm the most poverty-struck person I know. And unless I get some help to deal with the problem, that may not change. Anyhow, it goes on and on. I will try to put her in the bigger picture, and I will say, just think about all the sick children that are fighting for their lives in hospitals. Do you think you have a problem? Question mark. Love, worry. That's it. She will probably read it once, twice, and say, wait a minute, what am I really complaining about? And if this doesn't go through, she will probably email me again, and then I will tell her, you're very stubborn. I can't really help you. I'm not a miracle worker. At 11 o'clock, Geller prays over his emails before his replies are sent off by his assistants. For Geller, the number 11 has a special psychic significance. I have been attracted to the number 1111 for almost 18 years. It's like my, my face, my body would turn around and look at a clock and it would be 1111. Something is telling us out there, hey, pay attention. And then the incredible synchronicity of the terrorist attack on the 11th of September. And then I find out that Afghanistan is 11 letters. George W. Bush is 11 letters. Colin Powell is 11 letters. Jesus Christ is 11 letters. Harry Potter is 11 letters. There is something here that we cannot decipher yet. See what I mean? Look, 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 there it is. Why did you say to bring a clock? 11, 11, there you go. I mean, for goodness sake, is that a coincidence? No way. Geller's story begins in Israel in 1946. He was an only child in a family that, like the country, was constantly at war. Money was tight. His father was an army tank commander and a womanizer who gave the young Geller little attention. Geller was forced to spend time on his own, often playing in an overgrown garden. Fact and fantasy began to blur. He had what is broadly known as a Joan of Arc experience in a garden in Tel Aviv when he was about five. When he, I mean, to put it bluntly, thinks he saw a UFO and thinks he was affected by it in some way. One thing I know that it did happen, but what it was, I don't know. It could have been a supernatural event. 
it could have been an extraterrestrial encounter, but it also could have been something my own mind created, but created physically. It was out there, I could touch it if I would have stretched my hand. There's no other explanation. Geller claims that after this mysterious episode, he discovered spoons would miraculously bend while he was holding them. And while his mother was playing cards, he says he could telepathically read what was in her hand. At school, Geller appears to have kept quiet about his supposed supernatural powers. Instead, his friends remember him for his vivid imagination. Yuri was always a little bit bigger than life, it seemed to me, and he always wanted to be. He's the sort of fellow that if he could run around a building faster than anybody else, he would probably try to convince you that actually he jumped over the top of it. The only quirky thing that I recall was watches would always break when he wore them. But beyond that, he was a normal uh, kid, like Clark Kent was, I suppose, as a boy, right? Geller left school determined to be noticed. But it wasn't to his supernatural powers that he first turned. He began working as a male model, presenting the latest in underarm deodorants, beach towels, and cigarettes. Well, this is where I keep my past. This is such easy work, but it really was about the charisma that you could project out to the readers of the papers and convince them that, you know, you want them to buy that watch uh, or smoke that cigarette. And um, I found it very natural. But there is that um, feeling of you, you are wanted and um, maybe I needed that. It just eased me into the field of show business, entertainment. But it was not long before Geller outgrew modeling. He had bigger ambitions. While working as a youth leader at a summer camp, Geller decided he was ready to start unveiling his supposed superhuman powers. He began by performing feats of mind reading with his young audience. And he would really captivate all the kids that were like mesmerized. We were about 12 or 13 and most of the kids didn't really understand what it was. They thought it was just, you know, something really like magic or uh, they didn't really grasp it. I had a feeling that there's something more to it. So impressed was the teenage Shippy that he teamed up with Gella. His sister was to become Gella's wife and Shippy himself Geller's personal assistant. With Shippy's help, Geller devised a psychic stage show. Uri Geller usually begins his show with a couple of simple telepathic demonstrations. He, said, ah, he has his eyes bound and then asks somebody from the audience to write a name, a number, or a color on a blackboard upstage of him. Shortly afterward, he can then say what has been written on the board. Okay, so I'm sure it was Tokyo. Okay. <laughs> As well as apparently incredible feats of telepathy, Geller's show included metal bending and watch fixing, all supposedly done with the power of his mind. The performances were immediately controversial. There was nothing like this ever. I mean, you know, before we came on the scene, there was no such thing. Some skeptics tried to come up with all kind of explanations. They say, we found a book and we, we, it's rubbish, nonsense. There was no such thing. And um, so Israel were like amazed and theaters were packed, queues around the blocks, it was unbelievable. Audiences flocked to the theaters to find out if this psychic was for real. First of all, you see a y very young man, handsome, charismatic, a showman by nature. He was born a showman. Well, I'm a very rational person, so something in me rebelled against the Uri Geller phenomenon. But the more I met him, the more I saw that it couldn't be explained away by tricks and sleight of hand. The height of Uri Geller's fame in Israel was when he appeared to know that uh, Nasser, the president of Egypt, 
Israel's great enemy had died. He was doing a stage show. There were hundreds of people at the show. He purported to kind of faint and feel ill on the stage. He then announced that something dreadful had happened to President Nasser, and the show effectively ended. A few hours later, the announcement came from Radio Cairo that President Nasser had died, and that was his crowning moment. All hell broke loose. This was, of course, front page news. And Israel divided into pro and anti Uri Geller. University professors would be brought in, professors of physics would be brought in to investigate him and look at him from every angle. He'd be filmed secretly. There were persistent rumors of collaborators in the audience, although they were never found. Then the rumor got around that, well, it must be Shippy. If he was in a room doing something and I was there, they said, ah, did you look at Shippy? Did you see what he was doing? But if I went out of the room, then they'll say, did you look where Shippy went? And that was always the same, the same thing. The controversy fueled Geller's appeal. Then he walked out of the studio during his first ever television appearance when his supernatural powers failed him. By 1971, Geller's show business career in Israel had collapsed. I'll never forget the day I, I had to perform in nightclubs, underground, dingy places. No one watched, no one paid attention, everyone was smoking. My career was, was really finished. For him it was the tragedy, it was the destruction of everything that he fought for. He wanted to succeed here, he wanted to make money here, he wanted to have a family here. He didn't want to leave, but I said, listen, it's do or die. If you stay here, your name will be mud forever. In 1972, Geller went to the United States in search of a whole new audience. He arrived in California. It was the height of the Cold War. U.S. intelligence services were starting to worry that the Russians had discovered people who possessed unheard of psychic powers. For a number of years, CIA had been tracking Soviet work in the so-called ESP area. And they were really concerned because the uh, Soviets, including the KGB, were spending millions of dollars uh, every year on this kind of phenomena. They're very concerned about well, what could be being done to us. They were specifically interested in whether uh, individuals could extract information or get information from remote sites or from hidden material. And so it was critical to them to find out uh, you know, just what abilities do people have. Word had reached the CIA about an Israeli stage performer who had the talents they were looking for. Uri Geller was brought to the prestigious Stanford Research Institute in San Francisco for testing. Two laser physicists subjected Geller to a long series of controlled experiments. In March 1973, they went public with their results. This film describes a five-week investigation with Uri Geller, a young Israeli. Nothing has been restaged or specially created. The film contains some astonishing claims. The scientist said that time after time, Geller was a hidden object. You'll note he is very pleased with finding this target. Using his psychic powers, he was apparently able to change the weight of a piece of metal. The upper two traces are apparently due to Geller's effort. And over lunch in the SRI canteen, Geller bent dozens of spoons for the scientists. But his most incredible success was his apparent ability to telepathically read hidden drawings. Day after day, he would come into the laboratory and be able to reproduce a drawing that I had made at home and had in an envelope. And day after day, Uri would be able to make absolutely remarkable copies of that drawing. Here, the experiment is repeated. Certainly with regard to the ability to reproduce uh, hidden material, there's no doubt in our mind that Geller could do that. This is the drawing that Geller has made to correspond to the target object. As you can see, he is quite elated about getting the right answer. We had no idea about how this stuff could be done. 
were sort of like, where were people with gravity before Newton came along? I mean, gravity worked, clearly, but no one had an idea how. So similarly, here's some things that uh, we saw worked and happened, but no idea how. Uri Geller left SRI with the stamp of credibility. Leading scientists believed he did indeed possess unexplainable powers. Geller once again took to the road as a psychic entertainer. The Stanford Research Institute came up with an almost unanimous opinion that he was legitimate. Uri Geller. I have this power of uh, mind over matter. You were reading my mind, probably. I Pick up two spikes in your hand. Spikes? Yeah, there are spikes there. Concentrate on this spike. Just tell me if it starts moving in your hand, bending. I'll rub it. Is it bent? No. Yes, yes. it is. Yes. It is. Gee. It's bent. Geller's performances were an immediate hit. But not everyone was convinced that his powers were real. Some critics believed that the controls on the Stanford experiments were too weak. Others that Geller had been able to fool laser physicists who were not used to dealing with human subjects. There were even rumors that during the telepathy experiments, Geller had collaborators secretly transmitting information to a receiver hidden in his teeth. There were so many accusations from cigarette smoke to transmitters in my teeth. I mean, some of them were so ridiculous. And people really wanted to see, I mean, is it real? Is it not? Let's experience it for ourselves. As the controversy mounted, the story reached the influential news magazine, Time. Time magazine published a report stating that Geller's feats could be replicated by an accomplished magician. It cast huge doubt over his supposed superhuman powers. I would have rather said that it's real, but that didn't stop the TV shows. On the contrary, it catapulted me into huge recognition. Not Time magazine itself, not everyone reads Time magazine, but what it did to radio stations and television stations, they all wanted to interview me. In August 1973, Geller agreed to appear on America's highest-rated talk program, NBC's Johnny Carson Show. He was about to hit the big time. The Johnny Carson Show was, um, it was built as like the most important show you are going to do, you know, and, and it's going to make you. So they already started instilling in his mind. So he was like, he's got to succeed and all that. Nice to see you. Thanks. We uh, we this, have only met. This scares me. This, this scares you. Well, this <laughs> is just, we just got some things together here. Geller began by trying to douse for hidden water. What I do now is uh, try to have a sort of a feeling where the water is. Twenty-two million viewers watched as Geller failed to detect the hidden water. He refused to try any telepathy, and when it came to spoons, all he could manage was a very slight bend. It was humiliating very much to sit on the show, knowing that the presenter is against me. Can you see? Nowhere. <laughs> I knew that I felt the negativity. I mean, you could cut it with a knife. It was there, it was in the air. Well, Uri, I don't want you to feel bad about this tonight. I, the monologue doesn't work every night either. I was on like 22 minutes. It was uh, very grueling and, and quite strange for me to sit there knowing that so many millions of people are out there watching and nothing was happening. Geller came to Britain. It was the end of 1973 and the country was desperately in need of a beacon of sunshine. We are limiting the use of electricity by almost all factories to three days a week. Straight after the broadcast of the Miss World competition, Uri Geller was booked to make his first British TV appearance. Let's ask him on. Ladies and gentlemen, Uri Geller. <laughs> what I will try to do first is the telepathy, and I understand there is a sealed drawing Can I explain about here. this? This is a, a drawing that was done by one of our production assistants, and it's been sealed up like this, and I don't know what's in there, and Uri hasn't seen it until 
that moment. I don't want to waste a lot of time on it. It could be a boat. Here we are. Got it. <laughs> I thought that it was a magnificent performance. It was either completely unexplainable or he was the most extraordinary performer. Okay, there are some, uh, some broken watches here. Geller was winning over the audience. My God, minute hand has bent, bent. right angles. To the <laughs> it was an extraordinary performance. In front of millions of viewers, Geller had apparently demonstrated superhuman powers. By the following morning, he was headline news. Britain was entranced by this psychic performer. Geller was suddenly overwhelmed with invitations to perform in TV studios across the globe. Please, uh, if you can hear me, please draw it in your head, over and over and over. Yes! This was an elephant yes. from France. Uri Geller filled up the front pages of every newspaper around the world. He's got to refer Uri Geller. Germany, Scandinavia, the States, France, Spain, Portugal, everywhere was, was Geller mad. He was, for a period during the 70s, one of the most famous people in the world. At the height of my fame, it was just fantastic. The feeling that everyone wants you, it's just something that makes you feel proud of what you have managed to achieve. Plus, all these huge celebrities who wanted to meet me. Tony Curtis. I've seen Tony Curtis only in movie theaters. He wants to meet me in the flesh. Elvis Presley. The people I go up with for magazines and pictures and newspapers, will I really meet them? In a minute, they want to meet me. It was, it was unbelievable. He was what he wanted to be at the very beginning, which was a pop star. He never wanted to be anything other than that. He told people at the time, he just wanted to be famous, he wanted to get laid a hundred times a day, and he got all that instantly through bending spoons. In many ways, he was the right guy at the right time and place. Uh, even if Uri were absolutely real, uh, if he'd shown up in 1950 or 1990, he, I don't think he would have that impact that he had then. Of course, in the 70s, the space program was going strong. The astronauts and the moon landing you know, emphasized outer space, so we had all the UFO connections. Extraterrestrials were sort of on people's minds. In addition, the so-called uh, race for inner space was booming and he just fit it beautifully. Plus, Uri was fresh, young, handsome, vigorous, dynamic, uh, such chutzpah really about what he can do. You know, you, 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 you're inclined to think, well, maybe he knows something you don't. As Geller's fame spread, everyone wanted to share the secret. A new phenomenon was born, spoon-bending parties. <laughs> Everybody wanted to be Ori Geller. Everybody was bending spoons. Bang! Bang! Every playground was full of kids uh, saying, look, I can bend this, and stroking things, and then kind of bending them behind their back. Woo, look at this one, what Tammy did. Very good. This power may be no more than the combination of a warm spoon and a strong thumb. But like many who have an experience they cannot explain, these people find an answer in mysterious psychic forces. The most talented of the new spoon vendors were children. It was the breakthrough that some scientists had been waiting for. Geller and his assistant Shippy, however, were going from strength to strength. Oh my God. I can't believe that. This is incredible. I'll never forget this day. It was a mass hysteria. <laughs> Japan was always amazing because when people turned out to see you, the press, they were always like thousand photographers. Yeah, well, you can see it, look at this, amazing. And when we used to arrive at the airport, they'll always have like 20 girls with flowers. I remember there were times where all I could hear is the clicking of cameras. 
It was like a rainforest in Brazil. <laughs> you know, I'm looking at this now and the, the thought that flashes up in my mind is, how did I do it? It is incredible. You know, a simple little tiny bent key changed the world. Geller was flying high on his popular appeal and now claiming even more extraordinary powers. He declared that he could psychically empower people by sending telepathic messages from the air. What happens is that when I concentrate on something, the masses and millions concentrating at the same time gives an enormous energy. So what happened, and I'm sure it happened, that thousands of broken watches started ticking all across America. Geller and Shippy moved to Manhattan. They were mixing with wealthy eccentrics who succumbed to Geller's charms. Well, this is one of the first holidays we took with, with Uri. Byron invited him to join us on the music cruise in the Mediterranean. This is on the deck of the boat, Uri and myself and... Shippy and you. Shippy and me. And here's Uri doing his daily exercise lifting weights. <laughs> well, you know, he was challenged to stop the ship and he did. Hungarian orchestra said, Uri, come on, stop the boat. So he went to the back of the boat and he concentrated, about three minutes, came back, and uh, within a very short time, the boat began to slow down, slow down, slower, 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 came to a total stop. And people were saying, what's happened, what's happened? The captain came out and he said, don't worry, ladies and gentlemen, something's wrong with our rudder in the engine room, we'll fix it, and within two hours we'll be on our way. And of course, they did feel something had gone totally bent and all cockeyed, and we were just laughing our heads off because we knew what had happened. Even more incredible events were apparently taking place in secret. Gallup claims that he was asked to use his powers for undercover intelligence work. Out of the blue, I was approached by a CIA agent to do some spying work for them, and I loved it. They wanted to know if I could erase floppy disks that were on computers or in diplomatic pouches. My task was sitting next to KGB agents, looking at a diplomatic pouch, and in my mind, I would send sort of waves saying, erase, erase, erase. And I've done that many times. But then there was one time, and I will not mention which intelligence agency it was, but I was led into a room, and there was a pig in the middle of the room. And one of the scientists looked at his watch, and he said to me, I'm going out for lunch. By the time I come back, I want to see the pig dead. He says, try to influence the heart of the pig. You know, it's very similar to human beings. Well, you can imagine when I heard that. Everything collapsed in my mind about science and scientists. I suddenly hated the field, and um, I actually ran out. If there is any truth to Geller's claims, the details are still classified. But there's an even more mysterious chapter to Geller's story. Since his time in Israel, Geller had been undergoing long sessions of hypnosis for an eccentric American medical doctor. Under hypnosis, Geller had apparently discovered the source of his mysterious powers. The full story was revealed in his biography. Geller has just revealed in the book, Yuri, a new power. He is the channel through which alien beings, known as Huva, communicate with Earth. Their messages or their words would come in very strangely. Sometimes they come through me, and I'm in a state of, uh, let's say, hypnosis. But most of the time, which is even more shocking because other people see that, they, the voice appears on tapes. But the most shocking thing is, Frank, that after the thing finishes, the tape dematerializes. I mean, inside the cassette tape recorder, it just disappears. Now that all these tapes have mysteriously vanished, Geller's biography is the only record of what the aliens had to say. Supposedly there was this large mother ship from the planet Hova, you know, secret intelligences out there in the universe who were sort of 
controlling things and Uri was their messenger of sorts, you know. All kinds of really wild claims are made about uh, teleportations especially, dislocations, even predictions. Uh, it was all so absurd that I think in the end it was very damaging to Uri. Geller's claims were so outlandish that he began to alienate many of his supporters. By the late 1970s, public skepticism about the paranormal had become widespread. Geller was forced to publicly defend himself against his critics. The scientist is two and two has to be four. But in my case, this power is so strange that it's two and two is not four. And it's not tricks what I do, it's a real energy. In private, Geller had developed a damaging disorder known only to his closest friends. He was losing weight and, and there was a f sort of a franticness about his eating, which was suspicious. And an obsession with exercise. <laughs> and Byron and I kept saying, <laughs> she looked like you just released from a prisoner war camp. Yeah, he was very thin. He looked <coughs> terrible. Would you welcome, I don't know what you call him, telepath, telepath, telekinetic, Yuri Geller. Yuri? Why do you look so thin to me? Or, uh... Because I run every day 10 miles and I'm a total vegetarian. In reality, Geller had become bulimic. He would eat obsessively and then force himself to vomit his food. He was cracking up under the pressures of maintaining his superhuman image. I want you to hold the keys in your hand like this. I hated myself. I looked in the mirror and I saw a skeleton. And um, I just realized then that I was on a mission to kill myself. I wanted to finish me altogether once and for all. I suspect one of the things involved is a perceived need to be perfect, or a need to be perceived as perfect. And if you think of Uri getting hit constantly by criticism and by being told he was a fake, for me it's a very understandable trap he could have fallen into because you think you can't control the stuff that's going on around you, but at least you can control your body. Geller decided to take control of his life and to fight back against his critics with an army of lawyers. There have been charges that Geller is a fake, and now the whole thing has resulted in a $15 million lawsuit. So why are you suing all lies? One of the functions of his lawsuits, whether it was intended by him or not, uh, has been to shut up uh, some loudmouths and people who might overstep the line. I think a lot of people felt they could say anything about Ori. Uh, because, you know, they, they, they viewed him as a con man and so on, and they thought that was okay to say that. Uh, of course, it's not. Geller regained his health as the critics backed off, but skeptics no longer had a role to play. Times had changed. Ultimately, his appeal in America, in Britain, almost everywhere, really waned because everyone had seen uh, what he could do. The question of whether he was a paranormalist or a conjurer remained in a kind of an uncomfortable limbo. People had their own views and they weren't going to be shaken from them. It was time for Geller to move on. In 1986, Geller went into show business semi-retirement in the British countryside. My car. 1976 Cadillac Brome. Uh, I had to show off at that time to the world that I made it. <laughs> especially to my Israeli friends. Geller had turned from being a psychic entertainer to a business enterprise. His wealth supposedly comes from a lucrative offshoot of his superhuman powers. A number of mining companies have allegedly paid him to douse for oil and minerals. We were looking in the Solomon Islands for um, diamonds, actually. The plane maybe should fly this area at about 3,000 first. Mm -hmm. Uri came down and we paid him an upfront fee of about 200,000 US and, uh, you know, a percentage of what we were going to find. And we considered, you know, quite well worth the risk if it gave us an edge, which we think it did. The 
whole operation took maybe three hours. Yuri was very calm and put his hands over the maps and put his hands up in the air and we bumped around various places until Yuri felt that, he, that he'd, you know, got a strong sense that there was something there. We put an exploration team out on the property and actually recovered all of the indicator minerals for diamonds. Unfortunately, we never got to process the samples that we recovered to find whether there were diamonds in them because we got bogged down in some horrendous political issues in the Solomon Islands shortly after. The reality is that businessmen are idiots sometimes. So I see no reason to doubt these stories. He's been living in a at least $5 million house. You know, he's obviously doing very, very well indeed. I find it really quite extraordinary in a lot of ways because Uri is often paid not just to tell them where the oil is, but sometimes to tell them where the oil is not. Uh, so it's kind of an interesting situation that you can save people by telling them not to dig over here. And they're delighted and no one ever knows if there was oil there or not, I guess. Throughout the 80s and 90s, Geller claimed responsibility for a string of incredible events. When London's most famous clock suddenly stopped, Geller said it was down to his mind power. I took a postcard of the Big Ben, I walked into a little temple on my property, and I actually looked towards London and I looked at the postcard and I said, stop, stop, stop. When the Soviets surprisingly signed the critical 1987 Geneva Arms Treaty, Geller claimed he had made a crucial intervention. I focused on the Russian and I telepathically... Bend his medals. I know, I was telling him, <laughs> sign, sign, sign. And this is a serious, you know, this is yeah. nuclear arms reduction negotiation. And when the ball mysteriously moved before a penalty during an England-Scotland match, Geller declared a vital role. When I heard that the penalty is coming, I just uh, concentrated and I said, one, two, three, move! And at that instant, the ball moved. Are you ready to become a winner? These unprovable claims have kept Geller in the headlines and enabled him to sell a bizarre array of merchandise. As well as motivational videos, Geller has created an army of Uri bears designed to promote world peace. My little teddy bear with its little worldwide peace passport. There have been kids' toys, adult mind power kits, and now Geller promotes his own Uri jewelry on the shopping channel. Let this exquisite piece of jewelry focus your thoughts with positive images Please take the time to calm your mind, enjoy the beauty of my specially created jewelry. Please remember that there is no greater energy than your own mind power. Okay, we've got another sellout. The crystal ring has now gone. And you won't regret it. Bye for now. Bye. After more than 30 years mixing with politicians and pop stars, spies and scientists, Uri Geller has become a brand name. At heart, he remains a showman. He's returned to the stage, still determined to convince the world that he possesses superhuman powers. For good luck, I always sign my name on the wall of a theater. We're up to one minute stand by. Please welcome on stage, Mr. Thurry Gellar. Thank you. Wow, did you all bring spoons with you? Yes. Did you? Did you bring broken watches? Yes. Don't worry, I'll fix them later. I want you all to get up and bring the watches to the stage. One, two, three, one! Yeah, watches are beginning to tick here. One! I can see where some people would say, wait a minute, this man's a showman. Yeah, it's ticking. So? So what? Yeah, another one. So a great artist showman in a way. I want you to pull out, all of you, your house keys. You promised me that this was straight? Absolutely. Okay, totally bent out. What happened? My hand was actually throbbing. Really? Yeah. I love the mystery. The mysteriousness that engulfs me. By the way, do you, did you bring spoons with you? It's something that... Uh, you're too old. ...makes me... Tick. And I begin to stroke it. And if I will be remembered, bend, Mel, as Uri Geller. Yes, it's beginning. The spoon bender. So be it. There is, there. Don't clap hands. I will smile at it from the other side.
and I will go on helping other people in other dimensions.